This is the first video cast about creative research methods. I wrote a book on this which was published in 2015. It's a fast moving field and quite a lot's happened since then, but nevertheless I think what I wrote is still quite relevant. So when I was writing the book I really looked for examples of creative methods and I read about 800 research reports. I think about 500 made them into the book and about 100 are used as detailed boxed examples. So quite a big body of knowledge to draw on and as I was doing that work, that reading, I became aware that the research that I was reading really fell into four broad categories. They're not mutually exclusive of course and some research falls into more than one or falls into three or in a few cases even all four. But essentially these categories are, as you can see, arts-based research. Some people think that is creative research methods but actually it's just a subset although an important subset. There's also some very creative work being done using technology in research. Uh, mixed methods research is perhaps one of the most mature examples and then there are transformative research frameworks such as feminist research, participatory research, activist research and so on. I've also become aware since the book was written that indigenous methodologies are a pillar of their own uh, so I'll bring those into this presentation as such. We'll be looking now at arts-based research, then in the next video cast I'll be looking at research using technology and mixed methods research, and then in the last video cast I'll be covering transformative research frameworks and indigenous methodologies. So people often think that arts-based research equals the visual arts, but again that's not the whole story. Of course the visual arts are included but so are the performative arts, such as the arts of theatre and dance and song, comedy even, and the written arts, so fiction, poetry, playwriting, screenwriting, and music is included. I've already mentioned song, but there are other forms of including music as a facet of research. Also the technological arts, and this is of course where there's a crossover with research using technology, so video and film can be included in arts-based research. And storytelling, in a sense, all research is made up of stories. Stories are how we learn as human beings. We learn from stories that we hear from other people and we tell stories to explain things to people we're talking to. And every research project is a story, is made up of many stories, whether it's quantitative, qualitative or mixed methods. Numbers tell stories just as much as words do and researchers need to write stories around the numbers, the words, the images that they collect and interpret. There's a key debate within the Euro-Western paradigm around arts-based research about how skilled you need to be in the arts techniques you want to use. And this is a kind of a spectrum of debate really. And at one end there are researchers such as uh, Professor Jane Pirto in the United States who will not supervise doctoral students doing arts-based research unless they have been peer-reviewed to a similar level with the art that they want to work with as with the research that they want to work with. So peer review in the arts works differently from how it works in research. It's not just about writing and publishing in journals. It's about perhaps if you're a fine artist being exhibited in public, having an exhibition that people will attend or maybe even pay to attend. If you're a musician, it's about playing in a group, playing for other people, getting bookings, maybe producing CDs that people will pay money for, and so on. So these forms of peer review within the arts are about other artists recognising you as an artist of worth. And for Jane Pirtow, that's hugely important. And I think that is a defensible position and an understandable position, but it's certainly not the only position. At the other end of the spectrum, we have Katrina Douglas in the UK. And her view is that the arts should, are egalitarian, should be accessible by everyone, and that you can have a go, that you don't need to have ever written a song before, but you might decide you want to write a song about some data that you're analysing. And that by doing that, you will learn something, so it won't be wasted. If you've never written a song before, you're highly unlikely to write a very good song, but it'll still be a song. It might not be a song you ever want to share with anyone, but you will learn something from the process. You will see your data differently. It's absolutely fine, Katrina Douglas would argue, for you to do that if you choose. My own position is around the middle of this debate, so for me it depends on the context. If I'm using the draw and write technique with year one school pupils, 
I don't feel I need a massive level of artistic skill to administer that technique, to have children draw me a picture in response to a prompt and add a few words which they may write themselves if they're able or ask an adult to write for them if they're not yet ready to do that themselves. And I don't think I need a massive level of skill to interpret those drawings because I can use a form of content analysis. They're not going to be particularly sophisticated images, although I do recognise that if I had input from a fine artist, they might well see things differently from the way I would see them. Alternatively, if I was perhaps, as I have been in the past, working with young people who want to present findings using drama, I have minimal drama skills. I could do it, but I probably couldn't do it very well. So in that context, I would ask a drama worker, a young people's drama worker, to join the research team and to put in their expertise around producing drama. I would bring my expertise as a researcher. The young people would bring all their young people expertise and together we could produce a good result. Arts-based research isn't just about data gathering. As I've hinted, it can be used at all stages of the research process. So when you're designing research, some people think visually, some people prefer to think visually, find it very useful to use visual methods such as spidergrams where you write a problem or a word in the centre of a big piece of paper and then spin off with other thoughts in all directions and mind maps which are similar with perhaps a little bit more flow to them or timelines where you might draw out a long timeline on a big piece of paper and plot different points at which you want different things to happen to figure out whether your timing is realistic whether it's manageable in the context of perhaps other commitments that you may have. Then when you're reviewing literature, you can take a broader view of literature if you include arts-based research. Some people like to look at novels if they're studying sociology or if they're studying history of a certain period to look at the creative literature from that period. Personal documents such as diaries, if you can get access to them, can be very revealing. And self-published literature is gaining prominence there's literature such as zines, which are being collected by some universities now, such as Mount Royal in Canada or the University of Iowa. Both have collections of zines, which I think you can view online. Graphic novels, all sorts of things that you can bring into literature review that are arts-based types of literature. Then, of course, when you're gathering data, you can enhance interviews by using photography, so photo interviewing, photo elicitation, photo voice. There are a number of names for it, but this is perhaps one of the more common ways of doing arts-based data gathering. Poetic inquiry is also gathering momentum. People are asking research participants to write poems for them, keep journals, do maps, draw pictures, and so on and so forth. Then when you're doing analysis, you can use arts-based techniques for this as well. So again, poetic inquiry, you might write a poem about your data, you might create a poem from your data. You might create an iPoem. This is something that was devised by Susie Weller and Rosalind Edwards from the University of Southampton, where you take every statement from an interview transcript that begins with I or has I prominently within it, put them each on a line of their own, and they form a kind of poem that may tell you something really useful about that person's identity or how that person sees the subject under investigation. Analyzing metaphors can be very interesting if you're looking at how people see the world and how they represent the world to themselves and to other people. And writing screenplays with snippets of dialogue from participants or the kinds of dialogue participants might be using and then you can check that back with participants to see if they feel you've represented them authentically. Of course when you're writing, writing is a form of the arts. Even non-fiction writing is creative, I would argue. You're creating writing that wasn't there before, you're making a new argument, you're putting together words to make new sentences and sentences to make new paragraphs, that is a creative act. But you can also bring in techniques from so-called creative writing, so techniques from fiction, techniques from poetry, techniques of description, techniques of storytelling, and of course you can add in snippets of video if you're working with multimedia or if you're going to be publishing online examples of arts-based data you may have collected and photographs and so on which will bring what you're saying perhaps more to life. Then when you're presenting research there's loads of scope for using arts-based techniques, for using illustrations on your PowerPoint slides, using diagrams, graphs and infographics and so on, for using short videos for people to watch and if you're feeling brave or you have the skills for using some drama or some song or interpretive dance. If you haven't come across this, you might like to look up Dance Your PhD on YouTube, 
where natural and social scientists do present their PhDs in dance. It's really quite entertaining and quite instructive. And then again, when you're disseminating findings, of course, creative writing, but also exhibitions or installations, multimedia, and so on. There are various circumstances in which arts-based research is particularly helpful. I've never yet met a child who didn't respond positively to the question, would you like to draw me a picture, and being presented with a, some paper and some pretty coloured crayons. It's also useful where there are verbal language barriers. So if you're working with people who you don't speak or don't fluently speak a language in common, or people who have difficulty communicating, there's been some great work done using arts-based te based techniques with people who have dementia, or people who have brain injuries, or post-stroke survivors, so on and so forth. Also useful with mixed ability groups, where some may take more easily to the verbal or the textual than others. And it's also useful when you're working with particularly sensitive topics or emotive topics that might be hard to talk about, but much easier to draw a picture about or model about in clay or create a song about or whatever it may be. However, not everyone is comfortable with the arts. Some people are quite resistant. Some people feel they're not good at it. Some people feel it's well outside their comfort zone, feel very challenged by the idea. Some people will love the idea of doing arts-based work, but others will be reticent, perhaps really, really uncomfortable. And it's not OK to make research participants feel uncomfortable. So it's really worth having a second option in case you do come up against someone who's very reluctant and clearly feeling uncomfortable, have another option for those people in case of need. So that's a quick introduction to arts-based research and next I'll be looking at research using technology and mixed methods research. This is the second video cast on creative research methods. The first was on arts-based methods, and the third will cover transformative research frameworks and indigenous research methods. But this presentation is about research using technology and mixed methods research. We'll start by looking at the use of technology in research. Technology can be used at all stages of the research process. If nothing else, researchers are going to be sending emails to each other throughout from the very start to the very end of the process. But technology is most commonly used at the data collection and analysis stages, as well as for this communication that happens throughout. Technology is also very helpful for planning research. Think about spreadsheets, Gantt charts, all those great tools for project planning and project management that exist technologically. It's also great for setting research into context, we go to the internet to find academic literature, grey literature, other forms of context setting, secondary data perhaps that may set research into context. Great for presentation, PowerPoints, prezies and so on, and for dissemination through the internet, through multimedia, through CDs and so on. And of course for collaboration. Technology is a huge help to researchers, but it's not entirely only positive because technology can also go wrong. Equipment can break down, the skills of the researcher may be inadequate to the situation that they face, technologically speaking. Technology changes how we work as well. It enables, it gives us opportunities that we wouldn't otherwise have, as well as causing disappointment. For example, if you audio record an interview, get back to the office and discover that your tape or other recording device is in fact blank. That would be a nasty surprise. There are also nice surprises. Researchers are now using social media and apps and all kinds of technological devices. But we do need to remember that technology does change our research practice and try to acknowledge when that happens. It's not a bad thing in itself, but it is important to recognise when and how technology affects and has an impact on our practice as researchers. So if you're using technology in research, it's important to remember that the digital divide is still very much there and it's quite a big chasm, in fact. Those of us who work perhaps in universities or 
for organizations where we earn an income and all the organizations are technologically connected and we're technologically connected and we have maybe a smartphone and a laptop or an iPad or whatever it is. It can be easy to think that, oh, but everybody's connected. Everyone has access. Everyone's online. It's not true. There's still quite a percentage of people in the UK, for example, I think it's 28% at the last count, who don't have access to technology. And access itself isn't an absolute. So I'm quite well connected. I have a smartphone. I have a laptop. If I get mugged and my bag is stolen containing my smartphone and my laptop, how much access then do I have? None. Until I can maybe replace those items or find somebody else's device I can borrow to access the internet. So there is a problem of exclusion. If you're doing research using an app for a smartphone, your participant pool is only those people who have smartphones that can download and, and the skills to download and use that app. So exclusion isn't necessarily just about hardware, it can also be about skills. These are important things to remember. Also, doing research online, perhaps using social media or other forms of contacting people online, you need to be aware of ways that that can cause participants to become unsafe. It's harder to maintain privacy and anonymity online. You need to understand how people's identity can be tracked online. You may be, for example, doing research using Facebook. Your participants may give you permission to access their Facebook pages. They may friend you on Facebook so that you can collect your data. They may not realise that they're also inadvertently giving you access to other accounts connected to their Facebook account, to their Instagram account or their Pinterest account or their Twitter account, which they didn't consent to you using. As an ethical researcher, I'm sure you wouldn't use those accounts, but if you weren't ethical, you could do. And if someone else was able to hack your account and thereby access theirs, they could end up being stalked online or cyber bullied or other forms of undesirable and unsafe conduct that they could find themselves on the sharp receiving end of. So we need to be aware of our data footprint, of our participants' digital footprint and how those things can interact. Also, technology can be quite seductive and can actually inadvertently cause people to act unethically. So, for example, if you're analysing quantitative data using the SPSS software, Statistical Package for Social Scientists, you need to know which calculations and which tests you should run for your particular data set, its particular configuration. It's not ethical to run all the tests because if you're looking at a 5% probability level, and you run 100 tests, then five of those are likely to produce significant results. But that's not ethical, that's phishing, that's not okay. You need to run the tests that are appropriate for your data set and see if you get a significant result. Similarly with presentation, you can do all the charts and graphs and infographics. Your slides will be so overloaded that people won't be able to read them, let alone remember what it is you're trying to say. Just because you can make a bazillion charts using Excel doesn't mean it's a good idea. You need to make good decisions about what to present and how to present it and not let the technology lead the way. There are some real positives to research using technology. So, for example, video casts like this one have been used for explaining a research project so that perhaps people with memory impairment or young children are able to watch it more, to, more than once, as many times as they need till they decide whether or not they want to take part in the research. It may be someone talking like I'm doing here, or it may be animation, for example, for children. There have been some nice examples where researchers have produced little animations explaining what the research they're doing is about. Online surveys can be really useful because they can be made so complex, and yet the pathway through the survey from a participant's viewpoint may be only a few questions long. But there's lots of scope for if this answer is given at this point, go in that direction. If this other answer is given, go in the other direction. That might take 60 pages on paper, but online you can hide all the answers that aren't required, all the questions that you don't need the participants to answer, and simply present the ones that you do need. Also, it's quite easy to complete a survey if you are connected and you have a device on hand. It's quite easy to do it there and then. Click send, get it done. Video is great for observational research, although there are limitations. You're only going to see what the camera is pointing at. Unless you have more than one camera, you will miss some viewpoints. 
And also it's challenging to analyse because there are so many dimensions. If, you're, if you are observing people interacting in a natural situation, are you going to analyse their dialogue? Are you going to analyse their body language, their clothing? Wh what, else, what other factors might there be that you might want to analyse? It can become extremely complex and time consuming and difficult to transcribe as a result. But it is very accurate and it does enable you to go over and over again. So if you're videoing quite a complex situation, you can focus in on little areas to look at them again and see what's really going on more, much more easily than you can if you're observing something complex like that in person. Technology is great for crossing distances. So I've mentioned Skype interviewing, that's fantastic. I've conducted Skype interviews with people literally on the other side of the world and it's worked very well indeed. And for crossing boundaries in other ways, so across disciplinary boundaries, across organisational boundaries, technology helps us to understand what's going on in other arenas, helps to break down the old silos of disciplines and fields and organisations that used to cause really more problems than they solved in the sense of increasing the knowledge in the world. Technology is a great aid for teaching. It's really helpful for conveying information, for enabling people to look at video casts like this one in their own time, in their own way, and as much or as little of it as they like, rather than having to sit through a lengthy lecture at a time prescribed by someone else. And of course, we have access now to huge quantities of data through technology. Governments are making their data open, so are organisations. There's lots of secondary data, and this data is not only quantitative, but also qualitative. There are qualitative data repositories where you can find interview transcripts and all sorts of other kinds of qualitative data, images, and so on. So that's a brief overview of research using technology. Now we're going to look at mixed methods research. Traditionally, research methods weren't mixed, and what that meant in practice was that research was either quantitative or it was qualitative, and never the twain should meet. Then I think one day someone had a bright idea and said, let's talk to those other people doing that other research and see what they're about. And so the discipline of mixed methods research was born from those conversations and initially it was mixed quantitative and qualitative in the same project. This was radical for a time, then it became more mainstream. And now you can mix different quantitative methods and have a purely quantitative project that is still mixed methods, or equally you can mix different qualitative methods and have a whole project that is mixed methods but also entirely qualitative. Or you can mix quantitative and qualitative, as was done in the first place. Also, where this began was around mixing different methods of gathering data. So you might do a survey for the quantitative side and some interviews for the qualitative side and then analyse them separately, analyse them together. But now we also look at mixing methods of contextualising, so you might do a literature review and a different form of context setting, perhaps using quantitative data. You might use different kinds of literature in your literature review. You might incorporate images. That would be a form of mixing methods. You might mix methods of analysing your data, so you might use narrative analysis and discourse analysis and see if they tell you different things about the same data set. You might mix methods of writing, so you might write prose and poetry in the same presentation, same written presentation. You might mix methods of presenting. You might use speech and song and images and haiku. You might mix methods of dissemination, so you might have an exhibition, but then you might film that exhibition and put the film on YouTube. All sorts of ways that you can mix methods in research. But it's not for doing just for the sake of it, it's really only sensible to mix methods if your research question calls for you to do so. And that is important to remember. Where mixed methods research I think really comes into its own is when the research question is particularly complex. And so a single method isn't really going to cut it, isn't really going to enable us to investigate that question as fully as we need to do. There are some problems with mixed methods research. It does take more resources because you're using more methods, so inevitably it's going to take more time, more money, and so on. And it can be difficult working with researchers from other disciplines, particularly when they work perhaps in a slightly different paradigm. So it's important to have conversations at a very early stage about how you work, what methods you use, why you use those methods. 
find out what your epistemological and ontological stances are and how those can be integrated and how those can be brought to work together or if not integrated then how you can use from e each of those to contribute to the research process. Also it can be difficult at the ana analytic stage if you've got different data sets you're probably going to analyze those separately to begin with you may use different forms of analysis but there will come a point where you want to integrate or synthesize those findings to try to make a coherent narrative. That can be really difficult. Sometimes it's just not possible because they tell such different stories. That in itself raises an interesting question about why that should be. And it may simply indicate that you need to do further research, that you need to collect more data or analyze in a different way to try to get to the bottom of whatever the problem is that you're facing. Mixed methods research needs to be carefully designed as mixed methods project right from the start what won't work is if your research is going a bit rocky in the middle and you throw a few more methods in to try and fix it that's really not a good idea that's not going to work you need to plan it from the start and be clear about why you're using more than one method at whichever stage of the research process you want to mix your methods and this is probably the most mature of all the different types of creative research methods so there are some books and journals that i would recommend to you these are probably the classic ones in the field, so I'll leave them here on this slide for you to take down if you want to, write down or go and look for in the library or whatever. And that will end this presentation on mixed methods research. We will look next at transformative research frameworks and indigenous research methods. This is the third video cast about creative research methods. The first was about arts-based methods. The second was about research using technology and mixed methods research. And in this video cast, I'm going to look at transformative research frameworks and indigenous research methods. These have something in common in that they both explicitly aim to make research more ethical. And they try and do this by identifying addressing and reducing power imbalances. But they're not the same. So we're going to look at transformative research frameworks first. Examples of these frameworks are feminist, activist, participatory research. They came about from places of disadvantage, really. So feminist research began with women in the 1970s, women like Anne Oakley. I think she doesn't necessarily describe her research as feminist research, but it seems so to me. And Laurel Richardson in the US. Um, so Anne Oakley in the UK was looking at researching topics like housework and the way women are treated by men and Laurel Richardson in the US had similar interests at much the same time. And activist research came about from the disability rights movement, primarily people with physical disabilities, also people with mental health problems, saying if research is going to be done about us, we will do that research because we are actually the people who know what this is like and what's going on here. And participatory research is very much similar to that activist emancipatory paradigm. The, the um, motto, if you like, the tagline of activist research is often nothing about us without us. And that really sums up the whole point behind participatory research, which some people regard as useful and a good way of working beyond health issues or feminist issues. So why these research frameworks are called transformative is because the idea is that they will cause some kind of positive transformation through the research for people's living conditions, people's way, well-being, whatever it may be. So this is often very creative research. Research within transformative frameworks is often, in a sense, made up as it goes along, which doesn't mean that it has no rigour, but it is creative. Creativity in itself isn't ethical. It can be used if you think there are some very creative criminals. Think how creative the Joker is in Batman, for example. But creativity can be used for good, of course, as well as for evil. And there is evidence of a very strong relationship between creative thinking and ethical decision making. So 
Ethics isn't really just for research ethics committees or institutional review boards as they're known in America. I've done some other video casts on research ethics which are on this same website and go into the whole ethical side of things in more detail. But for now it does make sense to just say that in terms of transformative research frameworks, doing ethics isn't really part of that. It's a very ethical research process as a whole. And it's very much more about moving towards or promoting or trying to create social justice rather than simply a lower baseline of doing no harm. It's hard to do transformative research properly. It needs a lot of time. It probably needs a lot of money. There's no room for tokenism. It's got to be done well, it's got to be done thoroughly, and it's got to be done quite relationally. You need to take people seriously, give them a lot of respect. These ethical issues bring it into a very similar part of the research world as indigenous research methods, although, as I've already said, it's not the same. The key to all this is to communicate with everyone involved. Different people will have different kinds of knowledge which can be used to help the research, but communicating and helping them to communicate and allowing everyone to communicate is a, is a key to making this happen and making it work. It's also important to be realistic. While you may be able to reduce or even eradicate power imbalances within the purview of the research project, you're not likely to have a huge effect on those power imbalances far beyond the scope of the research. There was some interesting work done with Roma communities in Europe, nomadic peoples of Europe, the Roma, the Romani people, and some very participatory research was done with them using a specific form of participatory research called critical communicative methodology. Very much about everyone having something to communicate, something to offer, something to contribute to the research and enabling that to happen. Researchers from Barcelona developed this approach and they used it with Roma people who were initially very resistant to being involved in research because they'd experienced research as abusive, they'd experienced researchers as people who came and took data away and built their careers on it without benefiting the Romani people at all. But researchers gradually won the trust of the Romani people and worked with them to look at how to overcome problems like low employment levels within Romani communities and lower education levels, it's difficulties in accessing education and employment in Europe, partly because of nomadism, partly because of prejudice, and for other reasons too. So this research was completed and was eventually presented at the European Parliament with Romani people as part of the presenting team, and it caused changes in laws, in European law, so that Romani communities had more rights things like education, employment, health care and so on and this was enshrined in law so you could say that that made a real difference to the balance of power in Europe. However, subsequent research demonstrated that Romani people in their day-to-day -day lives really didn't feel a great deal of impact, if any at all, from this research. Which is a bit depressing but doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It's also important to remember that trans using transformative research frameworks brings ethical problems with it. It can seem that this research that's participatory, that reduces power imbalances, that is set up to be so ethical is just simply marvellous and ethical by default. One of the difficulties currently in the literature is that much that is written about transformative research frameworks is uncritical. And every framework for research, every methodology has its limitations and it's important to acknowledge and recognise those. So, for example, let's think about participatory research. Supposing you wanted to do longitudinal participatory research. It might sound like a marvellous idea from a researcher's viewpoint. Really interesting. But how does that look from a participant's viewpoint? Someone who might be asked to take part in research not only today or this week or this month, but for the rest of the year, maybe for years to come. That's a big commitment to ask for someone. How are you going to compensate them for that commitment? Will you be able to do that? this is a problem. In terms of writing, writing is often much less participatory. You may find participatory research is carried out in terms of much participation, even perhaps in research design, context setting, data gathering, data analysis. But when it comes to writing, it tends to be delegated to one person to do that. There are examples of people writing with participants, but they're fairly few and far between. And then because this type of research is so relational, there is a need to maintain or at least 
continue to acknowledge those relationships after the research has finished. And that can be challenging, again, in terms of time and resource and simply being able to maintain that many relationships in someone's life. So that's a very quick look at transformative research frameworks. Let's look now at indigenous research methods, which are similar but not the same. These methods are developed by indigenous researchers from indigenous communities in countries such as Australia, Canada, New Zealand, several African countries and many other parts of the world. And there's a tradition of research in many of these countries that long predates research in the Euro-Western tradition. Some oral traditions can trace their research activities back 40 or 50,000 years, which is a very long time. So this is a very mature and well-developed way of doing research. It is always collaborative. It's never one person is the researcher and the expert on research methods while other people are the participants. It's always done consensually and collaboratively in community. doesn't mean it's always problem free, but the aim is always to reach agreement and to discuss and to continue to discuss until an agreement is reached. It's often experimental or exploratory. It's usually about finding new knowledge, solving new problems. Replicating research isn't regarded as so important by indigenous researchers as it is in the Euro-Western paradigm, as I understand it. And of course, I must say here that I'm not an indigenous researcher myself. And I've learned this from books written by indigenous people and from listening to indigenous researchers speaking about their work. But I'm not really an expert. I'm just bringing this to you because I think it's hugely important. I think we all need to be aware that the Euro-Western paradigm is not by any means the only paradigm there is. Indigenous research is, is highly contextualised. It's for a specific problem in a specific place, for a specific community. And it's communities who test and approve research, not separate bodies such as research ethics committees or institutional review boards that simply come together to do that one piece of work. It's often incredibly creative, and yet it's embedded in tradition. So it manages to have a foot in both camps, solidly grounded in the tradition of the indigenous community conducting the research, but also very willing to look at new and different ways of doing things. Here's a useful quote from Bagale Chiliza, who is a professor in Botswana in Africa. She's talking about how literature is perceived by indigenous researchers. So in the Euro-Western paradigm, literature is primarily written, although we're beginning to widen that out a little bit and take into account perhaps some visual elements and some other non-textual elements. However, indigenous researchers have a very much more complex and rich view of literature, including things like dances and tattoos and community stories. You can see this here. So it's a different way of working, different basis on which to produce and create research. And there are other methods. These are just some of the methods that come into indigenous research. So ceremony. Some indigenous researchers regard research as a ceremony in itself, or there may be ceremonial parts to a research process. And within ceremony, there is ritual, and out with ceremony sometimes there is ritual. They're not the same thing. Ritual may also play a part in research. It can be used for data gathering or for introducing um, researchers from one community to another community, so on and so forth. Existing community structures are used. So research approval, ethical approval, will probably be given by perhaps a council of elders or a similar kind of body within a community of indigenous people. Um, talking circles are a common structure in some indigenous communities, which can be a useful way to gather data or to plan research, to discuss research, to think about what kind of research needs to be done in the community next. Indigenous research may well involve ancestors who may not be living because indigenous communities have ways of communicating with ancestors and respecting ancestors and regard ancestors as very much as part of the community, just as the living people are part of the community. And it may also involve the land, which can be a mem seen as perhaps akin to a member of a family or a member of a community or certainly part of a community that can teach and can learn and can take part in research activities. If we're from a Euro-Western paradigm, these kind of ways of working can feel quite alien, quite foreign and quite different. 
And some Euro-Western researchers are very dismissive. Oh, that's silly, you can't talk to people when they're dead. Oh, that's silly, the land can't teach you things. It's teachers who teach you things. But this kind of way of thinking is a form of epistemological imperialism or trying to dictate how knowledge exists, how knowledge is constructed and how people can know things. And one of the things that I find particularly useful as a research methods scholar myself in studying indigenous research methods is that it opens my mind to other ways of thinking, not necessarily ways that I'm going to adopt, but I think it's useful for me to have the awareness that there are many ways of thinking about and of knowing the world that we live in as researchers and as human beings.